Hello everybody, we have with us Sri Ramchandra Chakulia from Nal Group of University. He is Dean of International Affairs at Sonpet University here. Okay, just now he released a book on Modi, foreign policy. This is Modi Doctrine, you can see here. Sir, tell me the first, what motivated to write a book on Modi foreign policy? Just it is full of years on Thank you, thank you. Um, I thought that if we publish something on the Prime Minister's foreign policy now, while it is midway in his first term, it can help guide and you know uh, take the trajectory of the foreign policy in a desired direction for the remaining uh, part of his first term, and also uh, create a consciousness among young people, especially in this country, about uh, the work that he's been doing and how it's created concrete benefits for India and how also it's innovative and how it is changing India's approach to the world. So I thought that two and a half years is enough observation time to assess uh, how uh, this doctrine is being implemented and then of course to identify lacunae and to offer constructive criticism and suggestions for how it can get better uh, in the next uh, two and a half years. My main argument in the book is that if you give him ten years which is two terms uh, as prime minister, we will become an equal, equal of China in economic and military power and essentially second only to the United States uh, in overall power. So I think uh, my, I have been observing him for a long time uh, and prime minister because of his charisma and because of his uh, distinct uh, you know, way of communicating and uh, uh, winning hearts and minds around the world, he was an automatic winner in my mind in terms of uh, our overall diplomacy and uh, soft power outreach. So I've been observing closely for a couple of years and then I thought let me write this down so that it is on record and secondly it can help shape the future direction of uh, the Modi uh, foreign policy. On the independence day, Prime Minister raised the Balochistan issue. So is that valid in foreign policy? Have you seen? Well, uh, that is one of the many innovations that he has done. Uh, Balochistan, there have been accusations that India had been somehow secretly, somehow secretly uh, aiding uh, insurgency there as a tit-for-tat uh, measure uh, for many years. But we had never uh, publicly acknowledged any role. But uh, Prime Minister has done this because I think he believes that um, we need to apply all means of pressure to isolate uh, Pakistan, which has been sponsoring terrorism against us. And by uh, going public about what we are doing with Balochistan, I think he has sent the message of basically don't mess around with us. If you do, there will be consequences. And we have means of deterring uh, terrorism that is being sponsored across uh, our border. And Balochistan is one of the means. Uh, we have done surgical strikes, uh, again, another uh, very uh, novel. We have done surgical strikes, uh, again, another uh, very uh, novel uh, way of uh, trying to send a message across that there will be costs to terrorism. So Balochistan, surgical strikes, what we are doing with Iran through Chabahar, uh, all these are initiatives, uh, you know, which are being promoted by the Modi administration to try and send out a uh, you know, unmistakable uh, message that India is not a soft state, and India is not willing to uh, sit back and keep on absorbing blow after blow, and that there is a limit to our tolerance, and that we want to cooperate, but on economic issues, on cultural issues, and uh, we would like to still extend the hand of friendship. Prime Minister took a lot of risk by going to uh, Lahore uh, in a surprise move uh, in December 2015, uh, to meet Nawaz Sharif and I think he still believes that there are elements in that country that want uh, peaceful coexistence. So his strategy is to promote and to support those elements uh, uh, which include the people of Balochistan who look up to India to give them some kind of hope uh, when they are being crushed in all directions by uh, merciless and ruthless Pakistani military establishment. So I think it's the right message, it's a proactive approach. Uh, in the past we have simply, be, simply been sitting back and uh, saying that uh, somehow uh, we, ha we don't have a solution to stop this. We, we still don't have a solution, but I think we are going in the right direction through this proactive uh, diplomacy of our Prime Minister. So, um, what do you expect from uh, London, that is Brexit, after the Brexit? How would you see the India-UK relationship? Well, uh, as you know, uh, European Union is a major trading partner and an investor in India. Uh, most of these countries, uh, be it uh, Britain or the continental European countries, have uh, been significant, uh, you know, contributors to our economic uh, growth over the years. Prime Minister has wooed a lot of these countries individually, uh, France, Germany, especially, uh, and also Britain. 
and I think uh, Brexit is unfortunately a setback to the European project and to Europe's viability as a single economy. Um, now there are more and more Eurosceptic voices that are emerging from the grassroots um, uh, with the rise of these right-wing populists. And many of them want to turn inward and not to play an important role in the world. So to that extent, uh, Brexit does create challenges. We have been treating some uh, key partners in Europe as gateways to reach the rest of the European market. So if you are, if you are, so for example, if um, uh, Hinduja is, is based in London, then they can export from there to the rest of the Europe without facing tariffs, because they are all part of the single common market. But now that Britain has broken away, or is in the process of doing so, uh, it means that there will Indian businesses, Indian government, all of us have to think about which um, uh, horse to bet. Uh, earlier, the UK was our natural partner due to colonial and uh, post-colonial relations, due to English language, due to all these things. But now it looks like Britain is receding in importance in the world. As somebody said, it has become a small England rather than a Great Britain. And uh, in the process, I think we will have to look for new partners on the continent of Europe because that is where um, you know, the vast European market still is. And of course, we'll continue to have uh, beneficial relations with the UK. But by virtue of this inward turn, uh, the Europeans are generally rendering themselves irrelevant in the world. And unfortunately for them, uh, it's coming at a time when they're facing problems of immigration, of uh, you know, terrorism, and the Eurozone currency crisis. So all of these, if you add up, I think Europe is in decline. And, but it has opportunities for us, and Prime Minister is trying to extract maximum benefits for us because Britain cannot rely on the continental European market uh, as much as it used to before. So it's looking out more for Asian partners. That's why Theresa May, the new British Prime Minister, chose to visit India first among uh, her, in her overseas visits. And she's also looking at China. So it's an opportunity. It's a mixed bag. You know, like most uh, outcomes, there, is a, uh, there are some losses as well for the Europeans. But they will want to look at India more seriously. And I think it's good for us, because then we can have better bargaining power uh, with the British and with the Europeans. What is the role of America in South China policy, sir, especially in China? Uh, it is in flux. Uh, the Obama administration had a pivot to Asia strategy, which was to essentially to contain China's rise through a mixture of alliances and military deployments. Now uh, we are seeing, I, I would say, um, a great deal of uncertainty because of Donald Trump and what he will bring uh, in the next four years. Uh, Trump administration has not sent clear signals as to whether it will continue the Obama line of containing China or whether it's actually going to withdraw from uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, either way, I think India must be prepared. Uh, we will be OK if the, even if the Americans uh, depart uh, and withdraw, because then it means that there is greater um, emphasis on India uh, and uh, allied uh, countries in the region taking a you know, greater initiative of our own. In the past, we have been um, free riding on American security guarantees. And to some extent, there has been a complacency that America is there and it will keep the Chinese under check. But now, if Trump withdraws, uh, or does not take as much of a uh, China containment ro uh, role that the Americans previously used to have, we will need to step in. And we will need to take an initiative. We will need to show uh, greater military um, uh, you know, abilities in the Indian Ocean and in the Asia Pacific, and also build uh, beneficial uh, relations with uh, interested countries like Indonesia, Vietnam, Japan, um, and all the way up to the western coast of Africa uh, the eastern coast of Africa in the western Indian Ocean, there's an enormous potential for India to actually emerge as a world leader uh, in, in providing security in this region uh, in the light of the Chinese rise uh, because of Trump. So I would be optimistic uh, if even if he discontinues and reverses American policies towards China, it's not bad for us because the onus will be on us to provide leadership. And I think our prime minister is the kind of person who believes in taking leadership, in setting the rules rather than you know, uh, being at the receiving end of the rules uh, and the architecture. So what do you expect from the Cuban and American relations? The legend departed from the Cuba, Fidel Castro Francis Sylvia. What was the emerging situation from the Cuba and American relations? You know, uh, Obama administration made a sincere effort to bridge ties with Cuba and to uh, rebuild, to normalize relations. And they have opened a diplomatic mission now. And uh, slowly but surely, uh, the isolation that the USA was facing in Latin America because of its anti-Cuban position is ending. But again, the question is whether Trump will somehow reverse all these 
gains of the Obama administration suddenly take a more strident old Cold War style position which is to try and um, uh, punish Cuba. I think that's no longer possible. Uh, in India, we believe that uh, you know, Cuba is a great friend of the, all the developing nations of which fought for freedom. Uh, and we have a different view. Uh, we don't see Cuba as somehow as a menace to the region uh, as the uh, conservatives in the US have done. So one would hope that the Trump administration does not uh, abruptly uh, take America back to the 1960s or 70s when they had a, a confrontational position towards Cuba. Uh, and Latin America is also important for us, India, uh, in terms of economic uh, um, interactions. And I think prime ministers uh, done a lot more work in Latin America than many previous uh, Indian administrations combined. Uh, and he's uh, betting on the Caribbean and Latin American countries in a big way, not just as uh, you know, holders of natural resources for India's economic growth or as buyers of Indian products, but as strategic partners. So I think with Brazil especially, we've done uh, a lot. Uh, with Argentina, we need to do more. Cuba will remain central. So I think India is more accepted in that region than the US because the US has played a very controversial interventionist and neo-colonial role. So I think uh, Prime Minister has a special gift with um, uh, making small countries uh, comfortable with his diplomacy and they believe that India is a genuine partner, not someone who's coming to exploit them. So I think we have a huge opportunity in Latin America and Cuba will remain central uh, to our uh, role in that region. Sir, Donald Trump had a suspicious view about uh, India and uh, China, first of all. Later they shifted to Pakistan. Yeah. Is the world suspicious about Donald Trump because of his thoughts, say impressions? How do you see that? He is certainly a kind of a unknown category and uh, he suddenly emerged uh, with uh, a lot of um, uh, uninformed uh, views about what's happening around the world and he has shocked a lot of people and I think um, it will take f some time for this to settle down. Uh, once he assumes office in January, uh, and uh, 2017, he will hopefully uh, get better briefings uh, and uh, adjust and moderate some of his uh, wild viewpoints, uh, which have angered many uh, parts of the world, um, be it with Mexico, be it with China, be it with India, or any other part of the world. There is a unease about him. I think um, a lot of it will depend on whether um, the he continues this populist position of angering and abusing uh, the rest of the world in order to uh, satisfy uh, the instincts of his base, which is a uh, uh, grassroots, you know, white supremacist uh, position in the United States, or whether he, uh, you know, broadens his uh, base and uh, looks out for uh, alliances and uh, partnerships around the world. I don't think our partnership with the USA is going to suffer under Trump uh, because uh, end of the day uh, e Trump has uh, dedicated himself to countering ISIS and other extreme jihadist uh, kind of uh, elements and I think there he will find a willing partner in India and Prime Minister Modi uh, had a great personal chemistry with uh, Obama and I foresee no reasons why he cannot build the same kind of chemistry with uh, Donald Trump. Uh, in fact, uh, given the kind of personalities that both of them are, I would not be surprised if they actually have a you know uh, another so-called bromance like uh, 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 Prime Minister Modi had with um, with uh, with uh, Obama. So Indian states, especially in Tamil Nadu and uh, uh, West Bengal, they prioritize the uh, foreign policy. It means increase uh, the water share in rivers and healthy tea, especially in Sri Lanka. In what way just now Modi visited two countries at, uh, after a long time, especially Sri Lanka after 25 years after Rajiv Gandhi period. How do you How do you yeah, I think he has an ability to take along our states in our neighborhood policy. Uh, the fact that uh, we finally completed the land boundary agreement with Bangladesh after uh, it being stuck for 45 years shows that uh, he has an ability to convince regional leaders in India to work for the national interests. So Mamata Banerjee had been opposing uh, this land uh, swap agreement for a long time saying that it's a sellout for West Bengal and all that. But uh, Prime Minister Modi could convince her and take her along, and I think that made all the difference. If you go to Bangladesh and see how India is viewed so positively there now, it's thanks to our Prime Minister's ability to turn it around. You know, what he has done is he has given the people of Bangladesh hope that he can, in fact, he promised uh, Sheikh Hasina, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, I will do anything for you. And, you know, in, he's actually implemented it. And uh, 
people are so likewise with Sri Lanka unfortunately uh, as you know we got involved in militarily and also politically and but now with using Buddhism and using the Ramayana uh, circuit and all these cultural diplomacy he's been able to uh, get much closer and we've been able to check the advancing Chinese shadow in Sri Lanka uh, although that does not uh, seem to have vanished but we have gained in the last couple of years uh, especially since the defeat of Mahindra Rajapaksha. So I think uh, we are going to consolidate these relationships in our neighborhood. Except Pakistan, I think the neighborhood first policy of Prime Minister Modi is a success overall because they are willing to buy into the logic of India as a provider of security as well as of economic prosperity. The problem with the Pakistanis is that they are you know, caught in a suicidal uh, logic of trying to oppose India even if it hurts them. And that is unfortunately, so Prime Minister has been, as I said, uh, quite open to uh, building ties with them. But the rest of the neighbors, I think, um, has been a phenomenal success. And some of these big um, connectivity uh, projects that we need with our neighbors and extended neighbors into Southeast Asia through Myanmar, up to Thailand and Vietnam, Cambodia, those are the you know, projects that will ultimately bind this region together. And that's what I think the three Cs, as I show in my book, culture, commerce, and connectivity, of Prime Minister Modi is a winning formula uh, if it is implemented. So Modi visited uh, small nations like Mauritius, uh, uh, Fiji after a long time, at least 20, 25 years. What is the role of small nations in our foreign policy sector? You know, both with um, the Indian Ocean countries like Mauritius, Seychelles, um, Madagascar, uh, and also with uh, the Pacific nations like Fiji, Nauru, Solomon Islands. Most people in India have never even heard of these countries. But the point is these are UN members. And they are an important block to help us in our ultimate goal of becoming permanent members of the UN Security Council. So they vote for it in the General Assembly. And secondly, um, strategically, if you look at their location, they are on the western and eastern ends of the Indian Ocean. And there you need allies as well as uh, partners who are looking up to India as what we call net security providers. So I think uh, one of the uh, highlights of Prime Minister Modi's defense diplomacy has been in this region where we have gone out, we have helped uh, you know, these countries build up their coastal uh, radar and surveillance capabilities. We are also in integrating them into our, what we call uh, his vision of the blue economy, which is based on the oceans, on maritime commerce, and that will bind all of us together in a circle of prosperity. So through trade and through port-led uh, development, and through uh, uh, commerce that uh, brings down the costs of uh, export and import and so on. So I think uh, we, the, the, the ability to bring these small nations close to us and make them feel that they are respected and make them feel important is something that is special in his diplomacy, and I've outlined that in the book. So while he has a strategy for great powers, uh, he also has one for small powers and middle powers. And if you read my book, you will see how he's been able to create that level of comfort in a country as small as Bhutan or Fiji, there are people looking up to India now that we can offer them solutions, not just in you know, terms of security, but for economic growth. So I think overall, you would, I'd like to uh, say that there is uh, momentum in our foreign policy uh, today like never before. And I believe that if it is carried to its um, you know, uh, fruition in the next uh, two and a half and then the next another five years, we'll be able to really uh, uh, live up to our ambition, um, Prime Minister's ambition of becoming a leading power in the world. So, last question, sir. How, if you ask a common man, uh, if you ask a common man, what is the foreign policy? You don't know that. Tell me the simple meaning of foreign policy. How do you define that? See, it's about. We have to understand that we live in a society of nations, and we cannot be isolated and live only within our own house. We have neighbors, then we have extended neighbors. We have people out there walking on the street. And there is a degree of interdependence. Uh, we buy our milk from somebody, and uh, we give our services to somebody, and uh, somebody drops a newspaper in my house. So if you want the analogy to make it easily you know, intelligible for average people, we live in a community of nations. And uh, so we need to interact. We need to also have influence. We need to be able to, if, if we want to be leaders, we need to be able to set the pace for uh, how these, uh, the rest of these houses in our neighborhood um, shape up, uh, what kind of thinking happens in these countries, uh, in these uh, neighbors, what kind of um, attitude do, do they have towards me, how can I reduce hostility towards me from them, 
how can I create friendship? How can I build a cooperation that benefits them as well as me? This is the logic. You know, it's like we're an international society or a community. And uh, it depends to a great deal on foreign policy to be able to, uh, you know, protect us from hostile forces, but also to be able to spread our influence. So the Modi doctrine is all about how India can be a provider of solutions uh, to problems faced in the rest of the world, how we are no longer uh, you know, a poor little third world country that is at the receiving end of the rules that are being made by others. The Modi doctrine is about creating our own uh, architecture, our own uh, institutions that can benefit the rest of the world and through which we can actually bring about transformation of not just our country but the rest of the world, which is his slogan, Sabka Saat Sabka Vikas, is not just for a domestic constituency, but for the rest of the world, we are extending our hand of uh, friendship to say that uh, we have uh, certain abilities, we have the right attitude, and we are humble, and we are not uh, big brothers, we are not going to be bullies, and we invite the whole world to come and invest in this country and to also benefit from the growth that is happening in this country so that together we will rise, because divided we will fall. Thank you, sir. We have seen what we have. Thank you. My pleasure.